Welcome to the Lila Life Show. I am your host, Linda Andrews, back with another episode. And today we have Jean Tian. She is an amazing coach and the creator of the Success Method, who we're excited to dive in talking about consciousness, prosperity, and well being, and hear about healing and her methodology. Welcome to the show, Jean. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Linda. I'm so excited. It's fun as we've been chatting a little bit pre-show, but just to see some of the synergies that we have, and it mm -hmm. seems like some of the passions and one of the things that stuck out, and I can't wait to hear how you break down success and share that to our audience today, but also just how you got here. You know, if you could give a little brief origin story and why you're so passionate about the work that you do. Yeah. So I think my story is pretty much your typical immigrant story. So I am not even a first generation um, immigrant. I was born in Asia. My parents and I, with my younger brother, emigrated to the U US um, when I was only four years old. And, you know, growing up, everything was pretty much well defined for me. I had to get the grades, I had to enter into the Ivy League University and then come out and pursue. A professional degree. And then after that, my parents weren't really all that concerned with what I did, but those were the milestones that I had to achieve. And of course, you know, getting married and having kids, like that's your, you know, societal expectations too. Um, and through this journey that I was on, all the things that I was taught would make me happy, would make me successful, would make me comfortable, didn't work for me. I felt very much misaligned. I felt misunderstood. And even in corporate, I felt out of place because oftentimes, you know, I would see all of these things and it would bother me that these things were happening, but everybody else around me were like happy. They went along with it. Um, and so I thought that maybe there was something wrong with me, right? Like maybe it was because, I don't know, I'm broken and, I was never meant to be happy or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, there, there came a time about five, six years ago when I just woke up, things were going well in my job. I had, we just moved into a really nice neighborhood, you know, like all of the things on the outside, people would look at and say, oh, you've made it like you, you, you're doing really well in life. Right. But every day that period of my life, I would wake up and I would feel miserable. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. And like, I dreaded going into the office and then coming home and then having to be a mom. And I know that sounds horrible saying that, but then going through this process, this repeat cycle mm -hmm. was like, just not cutting it for me. And then, so I thought, you know, I needed to make a change and I needed to figure out what was going on with me. And so I started looking into this personal growth, personal development area mm -hmm. And what I realized was that everything I was doing was pretty much chasing the wrong things. And it wasn't about me being a mom, right? That made me unhappy, but it was about me giving myself to everyone else around me without knowing why, without you know taking the time for myself. This just, it just took away so much from me. And so, um, and when I started to realize this, when I started to look into it more, the changes that I made, even the smallest ones would bring about some of the biggest life changes, some of the biggest emotional changes. And, you know, just, and I never really did anything different at work, but the minute I started to look within myself and start to feel, you know, do the things that I needed to do and feel better, there were immediate changes that unfolded itself in my career mm. in you know, like the things outside of me, like, you know, things that people work really hard to achieve, to chase after it just naturally fell into place. And that is how I got to where I am today, because I realized that so many of us were taught this way of being, of existing, of chasing, of what it means to be successful when it doesn't have to be so hard. And I think we misplace this focus and attention that we have on what's outside of us, thinking that it'll get us closer to what it is that's within us, yet we're just totally missing <laughs> like this whole area that if we just focused on the inside, we get there a lot faster. I love it. it. It's so interesting. And, you know, we share some career similarities and 
I don't know if it would necessarily be a regret, but when I left Morgan Stanley, I was like imploding, you know, it was like, I kind of had to, I was in such a low spot. And it, I, that's the question sometimes is like, what would it have been like to integrate the work in that career? And it's really beautiful. And I think you share as a model to so many people that might feel similarly to like, oh, something is not right. Like, is there more to this? And where I jumped ship and then there was a whole slew of other issues that came from doing it that way, where it's like where, you know, being where you're planted and like doing that work you know, you, you mentioned something, it's like the beginning of the personal growth journey, which I'm sure you were doing it maybe without knowing, but what mm -hmm. was that conscious moment that was like maybe your first thing or your first taste of that personal development? Yeah. So it was in finding, it was like, it was for me to look for answers and in, in seeking the answers, I sought out my coaching, my coach. Right. Mm. And then, and I was looking at, and it's interesting because I actually, the first coach I hired, um, is a psychic and I've always continued to work with psychic coaches. Cool. It's just something <laughs> I find to be so much more effective, mm -hmm. um, than working. And I've worked with therapists before mm -hmm. and they're great too, but the psychic really just gets to the heart of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but they do it in a way that's, uh, um, that's guided for you, right? Not like you have to do it this way, et cetera, but you get to the bottom of it so much sooner. Mm -hmm. So that is the start of the personal journey that um, I've been on. Awesome. And, you know, you bring up a psychic coach, you came from a pretty structured upbringing. It sounds like, was there any stigma? Was there any pushback as you started navigating that part of your journey from yeah. family and loved ones? And how did you handle that? Yeah. So I never told my parents and I still don't tell my, <laughs> they will not listen to this episode, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and it was difficult because I felt like I had to hide it a little bit, even for my husband, because, mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't really believe in it. He mm -hmm. thinks that, you know, there's a certain stigma to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the Asian culture, psychics aren't necessarily the same in the way that we practice psychicness mm -hmm. now. Um, which is about energy and maintaining our energy and such. Um, in Asian culture, psychics are sometimes, you know, um, scams, but they look more as astrology, as fortune tellers. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think there was that whole mental shift of like, well, nobody can really tell you what your fortune is. And moving into the space of like, no, um, being a psychic is not necessarily fortune telling and actually I don't do the fortune telling thing anymore just because I realize it can change at any point in time mm -hmm. because it is so much based on energy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, 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 there was that stigma that had to be overlooked and there's no way that I go on and publicly announce this even as of right now, mm -hmm. just because it doesn't serve the purpose. Not that there's anything wrong with it, mm -hmm. but it just doesn't serve the purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, especially when you're still, looking to serve the corporate space. There's still a bit of stigma that they're not ready for when mm -hmm. it comes to this aspect of wellness and healing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about the word consciousness and how sometimes there can even be limited access to that. But I do yeah. feel like with the psychic, it's like, and even with the energy, it's like, where is your consciousness and how have you navigated your own consciousness to be in this, this moment? Yeah. So it's interesting because it took a while and nothing I'm t saying today is like, Oh, here today, gone tomorrow. Meaning like it was an overnight process. It's mm -hmm. an evolving journey. And then like, you're not in an end point, like you're still yes. on the journey. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I don't think we'll ever stop or I'll ever stop. Yeah, right. Neither. Until... <laughs> I'm with <laughs> you. Girl. Always something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but how has it, in terms of the consciousness aspect of it, I think it's just in understanding energy and the way that it works, it help us, it helps take back a lot more of the control that we have over our own energy, which raises our consciousness about how the energy in reality works, about how things work in general, mm -hmm. right? And then about how you know, I used to get bothered a lot and I still do oftentimes, like in terms of, oh, well, that person is rude or I can't believe this thing didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And, but the, the, the understanding of how energy works, the understanding of how consciousness works, it makes it so much more, um, 
not appealing, but it makes it so much easier to be able to understand the situation, to be able to work through and process it. And so in, and that's like, I think the infiltration of consciousness in the everyday aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I would love to hear your definition of energy, if you would like to give one, like navigating um, your own energy. (laughs) So, you know, I I guess for me, it's everything is made up of energy Mm is just different forms, right? Mm -hmm. So I think Einstein, Tesla, whatever you want to name famous scientists have all (laughs) proven that Um, with, I think even thoughts are energy, our beliefs are energy. And one thing that it's very conceptual and it's still a learning process for me is this aspect of, you know, the vibration of everything that we're saying now it's Mm -hmm. energy. And it has, you know, as we put it out there, it also has consequences. It's, it's the output that impacts other people too. Um, And so it's not just energy in terms of, Oh, we're so tired. Oh, I'm awake today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's energy. It's the way we feel. It's that, you know, like when we're crying because we're really sad or a movie really tugs at us, like all of that is energy and it's just a creation or, or it's almost like a different, um, recipe, Mm -hmm. right. Of energy. And like, you know, you put a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you create this end product that then has bigger ramifications. And in, in language, as you were saying, recipe, it, like the word language, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, you're learning that language within yourself and navigating that with others and it's changing and evolving. And, you know, yeah. I, I like recipes too, though. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think language, it's so true, right? Because everything that we put out there is just a different form of language. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit more about the success method and can you tell us what this each word stands for? Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, what dawned on me was that as I was working with my clients, it's so interesting because every, every one of my clients, especially, you know, you worked in finance, I worked Mm -hmm. in finance Mm -hmm. and people who work in finance tend to be very type A personalities. They're ambitious. They have, you know, goals that they want to get to, and they come to me because they're like, oh, I feel stuck, or I'm not sure how to maneuver around this. And then as we're working through these things, the first question I ask them is like, what's your definition of success? None of them Mm. had ever sat down to clearly define what their definition is, right? Mm. At which I think is absolutely crazy because of the fact that if you don't know what your success is, how will you ever get there? It's like driving around without an end destination, Mm. right? And so, um, so I think half the battle is the fact that without knowing what our success is, we're working and working and working and we're being told that we can have it all. But then as we're working, we're like, no, we can't really have it all. We're exhausted. Are you telling me that I have to work harder to have it all, et cetera. And so this success method came about because of the concept that I realized, you know, as I was going through my own journeys and watching those of my clients is that you can have it all and it doesn't have to be so hard Mm. and you don't have to give up anything because I think most of the time after we get to a certain point in our lives, right? We think, oh, well, it's too late to pivot. It's too late to do this. I don't want to give up my lifestyle. You know, I'm too comfortable. Right. Mm. And so this success method really doesn't force you to do any of that, to get to where you want to go. And so it's a seven step process. And the first one stands for S stands for, and it spells out success. Yeah. <laughs> so super easy to yes. remember. I'm like, the dots have to mean it stands yeah. for success. <laughs> exactly. It's an acronym. Yeah, it has everything to, else yeah. is in finance, right? Uh, I so like it. Staying on S brand stand- there. <laughs> so the S stands for sussing out what your definition of success is. And that's where the history behind it came from. Because mm-hmm. what I realized was that so many people don't know. They think they know, Mm -hmm. they think they know what they're working for, but when you ask them to like share it, they're like, "Uh, I don't know, which then, you know, we have a problem. Right. (laughs) And then, um, the next one is, uh, the U stands for underscoring all of the achievements and the success that you have achieved because Mm -hmm. we so often, and are, we're trained to do this, right? Everything that we're lacking, we're trained to focus on. And we forget about all the basics, all the big things, the little things that we have already achieved. 
And even if you got that promotion the next day, you're like, okay, next. <laughs> or even if you had the baby, you're like, okay, next, mm -hmm. right? And so we're never celebrating all of the things that we've done. And when we focus on the lack, as you know, from an energy perspective, that's all we see in our lives. And that's what we continue to grow because that's all we're looking for is the lack, right? And so this step is really to help you see how you have been successful already. How the things that if you were to take a step back, like from seven years ago and look at where you are now, you'd be like, holy crap, I've done this. Like, I've really done this. Like, I didn't think I ever could. Um, and it gives you that boost of confidence. It shifts that energy the way that you see yourself too. Um, and then C is to check. The first C is to check to see if the goals that you haven't reached yet are still aligned for you. Mm. Because kind of going back to step one, we go by these old goals that we created maybe when we were little or what somebody <laughs> had told us that we had to do and they're not aligned anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we cross those off, like cross off the ones that don't align with us because the next step, the next C is to create new ones that do align with you, that energize you, that where, you know, exactly like why you're doing it and what it is that you're doing. And then as you're doing this, what I tend to see is that people will create even bigger goals. They'll really feel kind of empowered mm. to go after their dreams, right? The things that people were like, yeah, you shouldn't do because you're too old to or whatever. They'll start to let go of that because they'll see like, oh, wait, no, I'm confident. I can do this. It's like the momentum. But exactly. Yeah, you're building on that. And as you're building on that, the energy will, will shift at some point into fear because you've never done it before, mm. because people around you have never done it before. And then, so the E is to energetically re-release that fear because mm. that's the only way that we know really works when it comes to moving past and healing through a lot of what we carry within us mm. that doesn't serve us anymore, right? And then the last two S's is really about staying in the energy as well as you know, making sure that you have, you stay in that state of mind mm -hmm. to continue moving forward. And that's all about staying in the energy as well. And that's where the self-care comes in. Mm. And I hate the commercialized versions of self-care that they sell these days, <laughs> because you can go to the spa for an hour, but if you're constantly on your phone during that hour, <laughs> that's not self-care. <laughs> I'm guilty of the phone in the bathtub and I'm like, I'm just asking for a lot of issues. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, take that away. Wasted a lot of water and a lot of Epsom salt right now. <laughs> it's just such a trap though. It is, it is. And it's hard, but you know, like do it for 10 minutes at first mm -hmm. and then do it for a little bit longer. You don't have to go cold turkey overnight because it's hard, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not really sustainable. So we really want to be able to incorporate the things that will support you, support your energy and your mindset in a more sustainable fashion. When you were talking, I think it was maybe the you, but it remind I was a swimmer and you know, in swimming like track, you can always go one one hundredth faster. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whatever, you don't even literally, you touch the wall, you look at your time and you're like, I could have gone faster. Yep. And it's just such an insidious, you know, cycle of that. And it, it represents to me what so much a life can feel like where, like you said, you have the baby and now what, and you do this and now what, yeah. and what that was the, you, am I correct? Yes, yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing. There's so many nuggets in there. And, you know, one of the things I'm very passionate about is healing. And, you know, you noted healing is required in order to create. Was that mm -hmm. something that you intuited, you know, without doing the healing work? Kind of a trick question. No, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> but how was healing something that was first nature to you? How did you come in to access that word? I know many oh people gosh. that that word, they're like, we can talk about wellness, but we're not going to talk about healing. And I'm just yeah. like, well, what are we it's doing scary. with the wellness if yeah. we're not healing? Like what? <laughs> You know, it's, and, and it goes back to this, like, and I hate to say this, but it goes back to this Western philosophy of healing, right? Mm -hmm. You treat the root, uh, you treat the symptoms, but never the root cause. Mm -hmm. And so was healing native to me? No, not at all. <laughs> but, you know, in, in Asian culture, we don't air our dirty laundry. We don't, I mean, 
very few, only recently have people started to come to accept the fact that therapy is, you know, normal and it doesn't make you a bad person or broken or anything. Um, you know, it was through my own personal journey that I discovered what healing really means. Mm -hmm. And, and it's not healing in the sense that you have a headache and you don't have it anymore, right? It, it's the sense that we understand where the headache is coming from. It's coming from the stress. Well, what's causing the stress? Well, it's this need that I have to constantly perform. And if I'm not performing, then da, 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 da. So that's the real healing aspect of it. And in allowing us to release those things that create all these symptoms, like that's really what it's all about. And then our bodies, you know, I think in the Eastern um, culture, like, it's about the root cause. It's about getting the body's energy to work in the way that it was supposed to, the way that we were born with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that from, um, you know, like kind of an emotional subconscious healing level, like mm -hmm. that's really what um, I think is important when you're looking at creativity as well. It feels like a vacuum, like you're clearing out and then there's room for, and just, yeah. I've never seen it visually like that until you just shared that explanation <laughs> of it. I was like, whoa, that's what it is. And it, you're making me laugh because my mom, she'll be like to my dad, I came from a very conservative Christian family. And uh, my, my mom will be like, yeah, she's studying quantum physics. Like she's trying to explain. And I'm just like, sort of, you know, but it, you know, it's making that room and having yeah. that, you know, zero point, if you will, for possibility. And, and that was the image that was coming through. Um, what's the hardest part for your clients and maybe even yourself? I, I like to reference this to you because the best coaches are doing the work for themselves. So to whatever that you want to share, but also that you see with your clients, the hardest part to get of the success method, where do you see people getting most tripped up in? And if you reflect on your own journey, what was like the stickiest part of that? It's the S, absolutely the mm -hmm. S part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and when you have problems with the S, you have problems with the C's as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, because so often people are so resistant to looking at things from a different perspective mm -hmm. and letting go of what success is supposed to mean to them in order to allow for what success is meant to mean for them, right? And, you know, I have had one client that I've worked with for a while and she's honestly a superb person mm -hmm. and super ambitious. And every time I'm like, what does success mean to you? Well, if I get promoted and da, 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 I'm like, okay, but what does that bring? Right? Well, it brings more fun. I'm like, okay, but what is that? You know? And then, so it's like getting into layers after layers, after layers, and people have to be comfortable with facing their own vulnerabilities. Mm. Because when you start to look at the deeper aspects of what success means to you currently and why it can't mean something else, it brings up a lot of the um, inner child mm. type of issues, mm -hmm. right? And it brings up a lot of you know what? It really does just bring up a lot of the inner child issues, a lot of the the the, my, the little T trauma mm -hmm. or whatever trauma you want to call mm -hmm. it, right? Um, and people are afraid of it. They don't want to talk about it. Yeah, that the success, I, I'll never forget sitting in Hoboken one day with a friend and just being like, I just don't get it. You get the car, the house, the job, the marriage, you know, then maybe the kids, like, what is this? And yeah. he's just looking at me like I'm an alien. Like, what do you, what do you mean? And I'm just like, there's gotta be more. And yeah. I think those are probably the beginnings of the writing the story of like, well, what really is success? And uh, I love how you also just say like, is this still what it, I want it to be? Is, is the things that maybe came from early childhood or the teenage years, am I still wanting that even? And I think it's so easy to grip into you know, those ideas and never let them go and feel that angst of it's not happening. It's like, you, cause you don't even want it. Yeah. Yeah. So what yeah. beautiful. But we're afraid to admit that we don't want it sometimes. Yeah. Right. It's and like, what, oh my gosh, but what does that mean? And, and what, what kind of it's, it's like propping up a fake story and there could be so many things that are attached to that. That's interesting. It's like the house of cards falls down. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> But if it doesn't fall down, then how do you get creative and create and build a new one? Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, we were trying to play Uno. 
Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, with the allowance, you know, you talk about allowance of oneself starts with acceptance. This is that flow of the creative juices. Where are people not like what, talk about allowance? I want to hear about allowance. I that word is a bit novel to me. I, I don't use yeah. that word often, so I'd love to okay. hear your uh, explanation of allowance. And uh, I get the acceptance part. I I love the acceptance. To me, the allowance is perhaps like letting something bigger than yourself come through. Uh, but what t- tell me? I want to know what's going on with the allowance yeah, and the so, acceptance. Um. So it's great. So let me ask you a question then, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you have acceptance if you don't have allowance? <laughs> I, you know, the, the thing I've been working on for a few years is control. Mm-hmm. And so the acceptance without the allowance is me blocking it with control. Mm-hmm. So you can't. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I think one of the things, oof, like, I don't want to sound negative on this one Mm -hmm. because I know it's just a phase that people are going through, but I think part of the the things that's kind of like creeping up in the spiritual industry, which in the, or in the wellness industry too, because spiritual is wellness, but like in the wellness industry is this aspect of, um, and I just lost my thought. It was a criticism. It makes you, you didn't want to be negative. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It'll come back. We're talking thought. about allowance yeah. and allowance. The acceptance. But, oh yes, I know. Um, high vibe, high vibe. If you have to be high vibe, that's it. And then I've had, and I went through a really tough time with one of my coaches. Is that you know, um, it was all about high vibe. And if you weren't high vibe, then she 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 like didn't want to work with you. Kind of like made you like a pariah within the group, wow. within her groups, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it just kind of makes, and, and it very much, and it wasn't the first time in my life, if I look back on it, right. Because as a firstborn daughter being Asian, like I had to be obedient. So I couldn't do certain things. Like I couldn't be angry. I couldn't be like, I would get yelled at because, um, I reacted poorly Mm -hmm. or, you know, I was, I was told I'm too, whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the part that I had to, until I I started working with another coach, I realized I was punishing myself for being who I am. Mm. And when I started to allow myself to be the person that I am, the reaction started to get less. Mm. I didn't have to fight it as much. And I was able to accept it. And then not only that, but once you start to accept it, you also start to see how it can be used to your advantage in terms of it's not a weakness anymore. It can be your strength. And so that's where I think allowance is so important, right? This like this whole thing, like, oh, don't be angry. Don't cry. Don't, da, 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 you know, yeah. like don't talk back. What You are the way who you are because there's certain things that happen to get you to this location. If you don't like it, change it. Absolutely. Right. But if it is who you are and you can't, or you choose not to change it, then allow it for it to be what it is with, and with the knowing of what the consequences are. And and I say this all within the realms of like not harming anybody else, Mm -hmm. but, you know, being impatient, being angry at something, you know, whatever, allow it because eventually you'll get angry at the same thing for the 11th time. And you'll realize like, this is so silly that I'm angry about it. Is this really how I want to feel? Mm-hmm. And when you accept that, okay, you know, it, you know, when you accept it, the 11th time will come and you'll start to change it. If you keep pushing it away, you're denying it. Like I'm not that's the bypassing that we hear. So exactly. trending. Yeah. Yep. I, I love that explanation. And it's funny because I, as you were, when I first read that the allowance of oneself starts with acceptance, the way I was interpreting that is like the acceptance and allowing like divine support. Mm -hmm. And so the acceptance, but that, and so what I was referencing is like the control, like the me, like I'm going to accept, but I'm going to control everything. And, but then that's me not being an allowance and the way you just anchored that it's like the allowing of exactly who you are and and then the accepting of that and then the miracles that flow through from all mm-hmm. that and that that just there's such a pretty shift there i think it could be both but it yeah, you know it absolutely a different one, lens it, it's very much it's very much centered 
um, I can't even speak right now for some reason, but there are uh, synergies between both as well, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are all part of this divine aspect and it's an allowing ourselves. And so like when we reject a part of ourselves, we can't be our whole selves, right? And then so, but then if you can't be your whole self, how can you be abundant? How can you be this? How can you be that? It doesn't work. Um, especially when you're looking at the divine aspect of you, like you're rejecting the divine aspect of you, which is all of it. It yeah. all is it, the, the, the suppression or repression of these different feelings that are coming up. You know, I, I laugh sharing a similar background where it was like, you know, don't cry. Don't, you know, don't cry. And it's, it's like, you know, as an adult, I'm catching up for all the don't cries. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, maybe this doesn't fully serve me, but right now it sure does. And I need yeah. to move through however many years of the not crying plus the now crying and like, we're, <laughs> you know, we'll move past it all. And there's something really empowering of the allowing plus the acceptance to then like the question maybe is like, and now what? And it and is this, but if you're not doing the first part of the work, you don't really get to fully get to the second part to yeah. look at that. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, this other question I have for you about the word should, and you know, I've, I've definitely heard this and I catch myself using the word should, but yeah. why is, why is looking at and analyzing one's use of the word should, you know, I should have worked out today. Why is looking at that should so important? Yeah, because if you look at the example that you provided, I should have worked out today, but mm -hmm. why? Mm -hmm. Why should you have, you know, why, whose expectations are you operating on, mm -hmm. right? Because if you were looking at it from, let's say, general consensus that working out three to four times a week is beneficial for your body, but not all bodies are created equal. Not all bodies need three to four workouts a week. Sometimes they need more, sometimes they need less. Sometimes during the year, it's more or less, right? Mm. So this should put so much pressure on ourselves to conform to these theories and these rules, quote unquote rules, mm. that don't necessarily mean wellness for us. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I'm also, you know, becoming more conscious of and becoming more intentional of is looking at it from my body's perspective. Like today, I had planned to go to the gym at 1045 to take class, although I probably shouldn't say, but anyway, so, um, but I was planning on going at 1045 and then, you know, but my body was so tired. Mm -hmm. And so I canceled it and I don't feel bad about it because my, I couldn't physically, like my body was too tired to get there. Should I have gone? Yes, because I needed to burn the calories. I needed to, you know, like I, I could have used that, but it doesn't, didn't suit me. It didn't suit my wellness. And if I pushed myself, I would have gotten injured or whatever, you know, that situation is. Mm -hmm. So I think this concept of should puts so much expectations on mm -hmm. us that it, it just stresses us out. It just goes against this whole aspect of wellness. Yeah. It's like the opposite. You're looking at it. Okay. This is for my wellness. And then what are you doing? Yeah. I, I rub up against this the most with and it, it may be former athlete syndrome or former finance syndrome, but it's like what a work day should look like mm -hmm. and that that's a big one. And it's just so ingrained and it's like, you're not doing enough. It should. And it's like, Whoa, yeah. like you're 24 seven entrepreneur. Like, what are you talking about? It's, yeah. it's, it's really interesting. It's a sneaky one, the shoulds. And where did the shoulds even come from? It's like, mm -hmm. where did that, and with work specifically, I'm always like, work was made for a specific person in our modern day society. And I may not fully be that person and I can be whatever I need that to be. Exactly. And that's like, that's one of the benefits of being an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? Um, you get to define what your work day looks like. Um, and I think to a certain extent, you know, I, it's not going to be in the near future, but I do think that it will evolve in, within the corporate space too, that this nine to five culture is not conducive to productivity for everybody that's in there. So, you know, I think the more that people understand how the body works, mm -hmm. how, you know, individuals work, I think there will be more customization. I don't know how it's going to happen, but <laughs> I do think that it will be um, much more accepting of different work behaviors. 
Yeah, I think about this a lot, actually. And, you know, what do we say? The future of work as a mm-hmm. segment. Uh, but it, it to me, it's like everybody is running energy differently. And so mm-hmm. wouldn't the idea to be to optimize that for each individual? And that's going to has to look different. And you see people through the past two years with so much going on and so many challenges, but it really ushered in more of a flexible work life. And it's like, yeah. what? why is this not catching up? And I, I really, the answer I've come to is because we have to be able to do benefits like based on time, yeah. you know? And, and yeah. I, but it's like, probably the output is far exceeding what someone even a decade could have done in a 40 yeah. hour work week. <laughs> so it's yeah. just such and then a- It's still not enough, right? right. Because once you assimilate into this, aspect, then it's like, okay, what's next? What's mm-hmm. next? Um, and nobody's ever, and you know, like how many people are actually sitting at their desk from nine to five and productive the entire eight hours? I would say literally no one. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, they're not, there's no way. And my dad, he still is working and he's always laughing, like no one's in the office and it's a, a sales job. And you know, there are people out and about, but it's just, it's different. And you know, you see someone grabbing their groceries on their lunch break or at the workout class at noon and that kind of flexibility that can give such an increase to well-being and, you know, not to mention family life and you give people that connection back in such a different way. And I am very optimistic about what this can evolve into. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very excited to see too. Um, I just have no idea how it's going to look, but, um, but I definitely agree. It'll definitely, it has to shift. Like, I think the pandemic just forced us to see that the same way of doing things isn't going to be the future of doing things. Yeah. The one question that I have that's become really apparent to me is around boundaries Mm. and how has boundaries, how does boundaries as a concept fit into the success method and what's your take on boundaries? Yeah. It's so funny that you asked that because, um, part of the segment in the book that I'm releasing Yay. on the success method is actually about boundaries. And mm-hmm. so there's this concept, right. That came to me as I was writing the book and it's not a new concept per se, but it was something that they're like, you know, ex- kind of explain the difference between a fence and a boundary, mm-hmm. right? You have a boundary that you establish for yourself, but boundaries can be fluid where mm-hmm. fences are just it's not as fluid. It's, mm-hmm. It is stuck in the ground. It is where it is. Mm-hmm. And so there are certain areas where you have a fence and there are certain areas where you have boundaries. Mm-hmm. And I think in work-life balance, I think for most part, generic work-life balance, mm-hmm. it's where boundaries fit in. Right. Mm-hmm. And so if you say, and I think this is something that we all have to get reused to or reacclimated to is that if you say my workday ends at 6 PM or mm-hmm. 8 PM or whatever it is, right. Then that's when your workday ends, Mm -hmm. right? So you can determine, but there may be situations where there's a deal coming up Mm -hmm. or there's a project coming due and you may have to put in a couple of extra hours around that time. And then, you know, for the next couple of days after the project is done, you get to go back and you get to maybe work until Um, one hour before what your normal boundary is to make up for the time, right? So I think there's certain areas where you establish what your boundaries are and you have to be, I think, flexible to a certain extent with it. And then there's other areas where you say, no, this is my fence. Mm -hmm. This is where I will not budge under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I will not allow for this. I will not tolerate it. Um, And so I think that is unique to each individual. And then with boundaries, I think it can be a little bit more fluid in terms of where it slightly adjusts because we understand that life isn't going to be um, consistently, you know, the same every single day. Right. As you were saying, I'm like picturing the cement fence (laughs) and I'm picturing the chain link fence. And I'm picturing, you know, like the different, like, this is a hard no. Yes, this is a hard no. Yeah. Like, you know, harassment, no. Right, this is, we're cement fence on this one. Oh, thank you. That's a really beautiful imagery. And I think a lot of people, and even in the world, I look around a lot right now and I'm like, this is so interesting what we're going through 
geopolitically, macroeconomically, and so much to me, it seems like a lack of boundaries. And it mm -hmm. seems like an ask to each of us to relook at boundaries and that tool and imagery of fence versus boundary, what level of offense could be really helpful to implement and feel really empowered and, uh, and, and just really, you know, write some of the things that could feel a bit off and sticky. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, yeah, we've just, I mean, talk about consciousness today, right? Mm -hmm. It's definitely shifting. Mm -hmm. Um, just, there's so much stuff going on in the environment. And so, you know, even for me, one of the things I will not do is I will not engage in, um, the news mm -hmm. to that extent that I used to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's because I think it's become clear that there's always two sides of the story. Mm -hmm. Right. And, mm -hmm. Um, and it's just a matter, and I don't think, you know, I don't think you're going to get the full story with just one source. I think it's a multiple of different sources and it's mm -hmm. almost like you, you get the tidbits, you get kind of people's sides, and then you kind of have to come up with your own view mm -hmm. without delving too much into like everybody else's story mm -hmm. of what they believe is happening these days. Um, but yeah, so that's an interesting like boundary slash mm -hmm, fence, depending mm -hmm. on where you put it in terms of like the things that are happening in this lifetime. Yeah, maybe a good fence, at least for some recovery. I feel like for some people, I, I find specific to media, it can feel like re-traumatization, mm. whatever side you're sitting on. Mm. And I, I look at that, and I'm like, oh, that's really, it's like a very eliciting, a very specific experience, no matter what kind of the truth is. Yeah. And uh and I, I, it concerns me and I, I feel my own nervous system burnout going through that. And it makes me really look at, whoa, like how much are we meant to hold? And, you know, there was an example, someone was talking about watching, you know, it was a tough world event and like watching a funeral of the world event and just being in the sorrow of that for so long. And it's like, it was a Saturday afternoon on their anniversary you know, and like, mm -hmm. that's just, you're, you may not be choosing <laughs> if you're unconscious that, but if you can see what that actually is and go into conscious, you know, a conscious choice. And, and that's a big part of this. And throughout your success method is the many opportunities to make choices and be empowered. And, you know, I think that's probably yeah. one of the most powerful parts of the work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about the individual's choice. It's putting that power back onto the person. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it too, is that if you think about it, and one of the things I get caught up in, and this is what I hate about politics too, is that it makes you feel powerless mm. because the decisions are being made for you. Um, the decisions are being made in the Supreme court, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not you agree with it, it doesn't really matter, but the decisions are being made away from you. Mm -hmm. They tell you to go vote, but then who ends up winning? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so many different aspects of it where the world is showing you, or it can be showing you that mm. you have no power mm -hmm. over kind of what's, ex what's happening in the world. But at the same time, I think that that's what they want you to see. They want to perpetuate that type of powerlessness because mm -hmm. then the masses won't go and feel empowered to make change, to demand change, to mm. create change, right? And I'm not a conspiracy theory. <laughs> you're you're good. I, I've given flavors but, of that, not yeah. in a weird way, but it's like to tap into what you ultimately, only you can make your choices. Yeah. And I think, you know, cause you were asking what this is bringing up is that question that you had asked earlier is like, what is energy, mm. right? And I think, what we all fail to see is that we individual have the energy to go and create change. We may not see it. We may not see it right away, but we have that power to go create the change, right? The things that we say, the things that we feel are what we're being put out there. The more of what we put out there, it, it compounds. Mm. And so, you know, we can continue to put more of this powerlessness out there. We can continue to put more of this anger. We can continue to put more of this division out there because that's, that's quite frankly, what, people want it's easier to control mm -hmm. but if we start to believe in our own power and start to do something I mean can you can you imagine the collective mm -hmm. energy that can be put out there like it's that would be amazing <laughs> yeah it's interesting because even around social media you know some of this technology can have such a numbing effect and take so many people out of themselves I've witnessed that within myself 
I'll never forget. It was like 20, it was early, like 2011, looking up social media addiction. And that's actually how I found Dr. Joe Dispenza's work. Oh, wow. I found Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, that book from that. There was, you could find nothing on social media addiction at the time. And uh, so, uh, you know, what a gift, like coming into that work and like breaking into so much mindset work. But uh, yeah, it's very interesting about how so much can be numbed by so many different angles, elements, including these past ideas of what success looks like. And then, you know, you kind of like wake up and are like, whoa, what? It, it, one of my favorite stories is like when the Amazon package came and I'm like crying because I don't remember buying it. It's just like, okay, I gotta, I gotta kind of get on a different program here. This is getting a little weird. And I'm like, I did buy um, it. Like it, it was me. Uh, that happens way too often. Yeah. And it kind of forces you to like, wait, am I doing things consciously <laughs> or am I just like, click? <laughs> yeah, it's just too easy. It is. So you mentioned your book. I would love to hear a little bit more about what readers can expect and how they can find it. And also we're going to drop a nice freebie for everyone in the show notes. But if you could spotlight some of your work, this has been such a fun, wonderful, inspiring conversation. So for Thanks. those that want to yeah, continue yeah. on, I feel like I've known you forever and it's been I know I feel like we could chat forever (laughs) um and so the book is called your your success blueprint and it basically going it goes through the seven step success method Mm -hmm. and by going through that you basically create this action plan of Mm -hmm. what or this like blueprint of what your success is meant to look like you're drawing it out as you would or as one architect would Mm -hmm. right and so you become the architect of your success And that in and of itself is pretty empowering. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I went through the seven steps and what it means, but then this one takes you through it in more detail, each step in more detail, but it also gives you journaling prompts to help Mm. you get to where um, you want to go in order so that you have the tools that you need in order to create that blueprint. Um, And then as for the freebie, you know, I think for us, you know, kind of what we were talking about before, right, with wellness, with consciousness is that we tend to I hear all the time I'm so busy I'm so busy I'm so I don't have the time yes I don't have the time oh my gosh I have to sit down and journal for 10 minutes Mm -hmm. even though like we know that the rewards are you know monumental and so much but yeah like you know so much so much but um but the freebie is really going to work through and help the user work through what it is that's keeping them busy and turning that into what it is that's keeping them productive. And so, so often we're like, oh, I can't put in more time because I'm already so busy. How am I supposed to work harder in order to get to a higher level of success? Well, you don't have to, you work smarter. And this process of both your success blueprint that using the method and the freebie gets you to work smarter in such um, an easy kind of digestible way of doing things. Now you do have to find the time and make the time to work through it, to get the results, <laughs> which is your choice. Yes, exactly. I can't do it for you. It's not a magic wand, although there are many times I wish I had a magic wand, and I just like, <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Maybe one day, maybe one day it'll be that galactic, but not today. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, Thank you so much, Jean. This is a real pleasure. And before we wrap, just any final thought, closing wishes for listeners that are tuning in today that, you know, if they're finding themselves in a disempowered, uninspired, or maybe in a real like flow, but that can just keep them feeling, you know, keep going. You got this. Yeah. I think the one big tool I will um, leave everybody with is the tool of questions, because when you are, and I'll, I'll say this, when you are feeling disempowered, when you're feeling like you don't have a choice, it's the question of, is that really true? Do I really not have a choice? What else is possible? And as you're, as you're asking these questions, you'll realize that you always have a choice. It's not really true. And there's other things that are possible. Now you may not want to do the other things, but that's a different question, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a different scenario, but I think it then puts the power back into you to make that choice rather than feeling like you're a victim of the situation. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. If you've enjoyed this episode, share it with a loved one. Jean will have those uh, show notes with the link for you. And uh, just thanks again for being here today. And everyone, I'm wishing you many blessings on your journey. Thanks again.